your equity market staring down a flatter yield curve and doing OK for now. Equity futures up a third of 1%. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. from New York City, we begin with the big issue, pricing in a quicker Fed. They are certainly in the mode to raise rates right now. Getting there a little faster. It's possible that the cycle is faster uh, and, and hotter. The market can handle it. What Chair Powell told us all today was that's exactly the sort of thing that should be on the table. Would we do 50 if it was up to us? Powell has joked about raising rates 50 basis points. They are on a path to continue raising rates. That puts a lot of pressure uh, uh, on markets. You look at the two year, the five year, they've all priced in the tightening. The market starts to see, yes, we'll have a very uh, aggressive uh, path to interest rates um, over the next year, but uh, it seems to be short-lived. The Fed is very much still intellectually dovish, but cyclically hawkish. We have a quite un un unpleasant situation for, for, for markets currently. But clearly, 50 basis point hikes are on the table. Let's get to the panel. BlackRock's Wei Li, Alliance Bernstein's Gershon Distenfeld, and Eric Nelson of Wells Fargo. Wei Li, first to you. You do not believe the Fed can deliver an aggressive path. Why? Well, we think that getting faster to neutral is uh, fair enough because the restart of the economy does not need additional stimulus. But we do not think that it can carry through the entirety of uh, the, the, the tightening that it has signaled. Um, because uh, if you think about uh, uh, what it has forecasted in its economic uh, uh, projection, it doesn't think that the tightening is going to have uh, any meaningful impact on unemployment, which signals to us that they are actually just talking tough because additional tightening beyond neutral is going to come at a cost of what well, heavy cost to uh, the labor market, to the economy. And talking tough right now does not, it, it's not costly. They can, they can do that, right? And if you think about kind of the flatness of the curve and also uh, parts of the curve inverting, 510 inverting, it goes to show that actually, um, whilst we don't believe that they would carry through the entirety of the tightening, risks of policy by way of over tightening has reason. The risk of um, uh, slamming the brakes has a reason, which is why we continue to reiterate our underweight in uh, uh, U.S. government bonds uh, and, and against that pair that with the overweight in developed market equities. Gershon, your view on this as well, please. Do you think the economy can take this, the plan the Fed has? Well, the question is, what, what, is, the, the, what is really the plan? Like, remember, John, Four months ago, if you look at the dot plot, the most hawkish dot is today the most dovish dot. So things can change very, very quickly. And what the Fed is saying is like they they actually don't know. You know, the, the, the whole market is used to the Fed, you know, not withdrawing the, uh, the what's it called, the punch from the punch bowl. I, I messed up that uh, that saying. Um, but what 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 Powell's what Chair Powell's been saying is that we're not afraid to do 50 basis points. We're not afraid to be aggressive and. I think that we have to recognize that it's not only a matter of tightening financial conditions, which the Fed is going to try and do to, to, to slow down inflation, but also the supply chain issues hopefully are going to be worked out. We don't know the kind of balance between those two. And depending on where inflation is later in the year, we're going to see the Fed either keep on going or, or start to really moderate. What's very unusual about this, the, the future pricing, you look at the euro dollar curves, um, for 2024, it's pricing in cuts. We've never seen that before at the start of a, hike, of a tightening cycle. We've only had one hike. Goldman says there's more to come, 50 basis points at both the May and the June meetings. Eric, I want to come to you. Out of all the contradictions in the summary of economic projections, one thing stands out for you. You think the end peak rate for Fed funds is going to be much higher than some people believe. Why is that, Eric? Well, John, if you look back at the last couple tightening cycles, what stands out is the real Fed funds rate ends up in positive territory. So even if you have the, the assumption that inflation settles back down to, let's say, 3% for argument's sake, 
you're still looking at a, a nominal Fed funds rate that has to go above three. That's pretty far off from the Fed's projection around 2.4. So we think there's more upside for terminal rate pricing. And we think the one area where markets, I think, are really getting this wrong is that the Fed can deliver on its plan uh, of tightening pretty, pretty aggressively and, and probably can get that terminal rate above 3 percent, which means more upside for both front end and long end U.S. yields. Well, Jim Bullard of the St. Louis Fed would like to be above 3 percent this year, not next year, not the year after, by year end. He said faster is better. Take a listen. Faster is better. I think 50 basis point moves would definitely be in the mix. Right now, we're putting upward pressure on inflation. It's the wrong place to be, given where inflation is. It's the wrong place to be, Mike McKee. Your take on that interview, and great interview, by the way, from 30 minutes ago. Well, John, I think that we all knew Jim Bullard was going to be aggressive. He'd wanted 50 basis points before the last meeting. And now he says with what Chairman Powell laid out yesterday, that 50 basis points for several meetings in a row is a live possibility. And he'd support that because, as you mentioned, he is the dot that is the highest on the left-hand side of the dot plot uh, for 2022, 300 basis points. And what he said was really interesting that he thinks we should go up by 300 basis points, but neutral is only 200. Uh, so he thinks the Fed needs to get restrictive for a while by about a percentage point in the uh, next couple months to be able to cut off inflation. Then it can come back down. Uh, the fact that he thinks that uh, neutral would be about 2 percent is interesting because uh, that would take most of the inflationary pressure out of the economy if the Fed got that high and bring us back to the sort of status quo before the pandemic. Soft landing. He's talking about a soft landing, Mike. Mohammed's writing this morning, and I'll catch up with Mohammed al a little bit later this hour. He said the central bank appears to have a choice between risking a recession or prolonging inflation. I didn't get the sense from Jim Bullard, Mike, an hour ago that that was his take. No, he seems to think the economy is going to be strong enough. I asked him how we make sense of the summary of economic projections that calls for inflation to fall, a restrictive Fed funds rate, and yet unemployment doesn't move. And he said the economy is really strong. The labor market is the strongest it's been in a generation. And that given the number of job openings, we shouldn't have to worry about unemployment going up significantly. So we shouldn't have to worry about recession. He looked back to, uh, he looks back to 1994, the famous episode where Alan Greenspan pushed up rates 300 basis points and he said you know we didn't uh, have a big problem with unemployment then we brought inflation down to around the 2 percent target and it stayed there uh, he also thinks that uh, yield cur yield curve too much attention being paid to yield curves because so the three-month tenure is steepening and you really have to have a long period in which yield curves invert uh, right now, they're being uh, distorted by inflation rather than growth feelings. So uh, he said that uh, things are much better than they appear for the underlying economy. It's just that inflation needs to be dealt with. One view from the Fed. Mike McKee, fantastic. Again, just brilliant, as always. And more Fed speaks still to come through the week and through today. A little bit later, we hear from the New York Fed president, Mr. Williams. Then we hear from Daly. We hear from Mester as well. Through the week, you'll hear from pretty much everybody. Wei Lee, I want to come back to you. You used that phrase. That concept, the neutral rate. Where do you think neutral is? Well, so far, what has been talked about is 2%. We think that's slightly lower than that, probably is where, um, where neutral is. But, um, but, but, but to the point that was just made just now, that racing to neutral, getting faster towards neutral, we think that's absolutely justified, but it really is Beyond that, what the Fed manages to do uh, is, uh, is, is important for risk assets. So we're really talking about a very narrow landing strip for the Fed. On the one hand, uh, normalizing policy, but on the other hand, trying not to have too much impact on, on growth and unemployment. And that being the case, uh, actually going too aggressively beyond neutral, which would be very, uh, very counter uh, counterproductive. Uh, and, and it's at some point, we also have to talk about at which point 10-year uh, 
two year of yield levels would bring into question that serviceability that we have just taken for granted in this low yield uh, environment. And also at which point the read across to equities uh, is, uh, is, um, is, is going to be contained, right? Because it's really remarkable that we're seeing incredible moves in uh, fixed income, but equities are holding up really quite well again today um, Wayne, you see exactly the same thing again today up seven basis points on the front end equities fine Gershon I want to come to you on that what is troublesome for the economy and what is troublesome for the market can be two different things sometimes in fact a lot of the time when do you think this starts to become more problematic more broadly for financial conditions and for this market oh, I think like, the Fed does not have a very good history of engineering a soft landing yeah and I think the hope is that this time is different. And there are some differences this time. We, we don't have the excesses either in the consumer sector or the corporate sector. Actually, the corporate sector is in pretty good shape. We haven't had a long enough time period from, from COVID for companies to start doing what they normally do. You know, they've been focused on, on costs, on, uh, on shoring up their liquidity. They haven't been focused on share buybacks and M&A and spending up CapEx. So there are reasons to be hopeful. What I think markets are going to look towards are, you know, where are we six months from now? Whether the Fed ends up hiking another 75 or 150, is it bringing inflation down? If it's not bringing inflation down, we're going to have real problems. I don't know what the definition of stagflation is, quite frankly, but we have to face the, the markets have to face the fact that we're likely in for a period of uh, higher than normal inflation, which we've been in, and probably if the Fed, you know, uh, takes enough liquidity out here, probably lower growth. Equities up a third of 1%, 20 minutes out from the up and in balance. Yields are higher, much higher, up almost eight basis points, seven, eight basis points on tens, up seven basis points on twos to 218, just short of 219 at the moment. Wei Lee, Gershon, Eric sticking with us. Joining us now with your stocks ahead of the opening bell, about 20 minutes away, here's Abby. Well, John, helping that modest rise for the S&P 500 futures, we have some earnings and buyback stories to take a look at. First off, with earnings, Nike popping sharply higher on a less bad than feared quarter, especially relative to China. They put up a solid top and bottom line beat. One analyst calling it a big sigh of relief that supply chains didn't weigh more. Lots of price targets raised on the street. Alibaba soaring up about 10 percent as they have announced a $25 billion buyback to lift sentiment. Of course, this was the original China tech stock to drag down the sector that crackdown, regulatory crackdown out of Beijing starting in late 2020 into 2021. Start of a 75 percent decline. You can see, though, today shareholders are relieved by this move. And then Carnival, they put up an OK quarter. And despite the rebound for uh, travel and firmer pricing, some analysts think that they could be affected by rising, surging uh, fuel prices. So the stock up just modestly, John. Abby Thank you. Coming up, Russia expanding its assault across Ukraine. We're on day 26. Uh, the Russians have uh, clearly not achieved many or almost all of the objectives that they uh, that we believe they were setting out to to achieve. The U.S. starting to see signs of desperation. That's next. Based on evolving intelligence, Russia may be planning a cyber attack against us. It's a patriotic obligation to invest as much as you can in making sure, and we will, hurt, will help in any way, that you have built up your technological capacity to deal with cyber, with cyber attacks. Another warning from the President of the United States, warning about a potential Russian response to mounting sanctions ahead of this week's EU summit. France's State Secretary telling reporters, quote, we will increase pressure on Russia if we need to impose new sanctions. We will do so. Discussions are underway. Maria Tadeo joins us now from Brussels. Maria, you know the topic of conversation right now for many people. It's crude. Can the Europeans agree to do something on energy this week? Yeah. 
Yeah, and absolutely. It's a big thing. But I would say, and, and I would really cautious everyone out there, because there does seem to be a real mismatch uh, between what we hear here in Brussels and what the market at time it's pricing in. Essentially, when I speak to my sources here, they say, of course, this is now back on the table. This is already for many a victory for the Eastern Europeans who really wanted this back on the table. Remember, a week ago, we weren't talking about this. Uh, the Germans managed in many ways to just like brush it and put it aside, saying it's a done deal. We're not able to unplug from Russia and that's the end of the conversation. Well, the conversation is back, and it's back in a big way ahead of that big meeting on Thursday. But I would say, and I would cautious everyone about this, is when I speak to my sources, and I've asked them this question repeatedly today, flat out, are we going to see anything that looks like a full, potentially even a, a partial ban on Russian energy imports? And they continue to tell me the same. There is no consensus for the time being, and every major decision has to be accepted by the 27 countries that form the European Union to make things more complicated you have the Hungarian leader Viktor Orban who's up for re-election in two weeks time who has a very complicated relationship with the European Union but also a very close relationship with Russia saying I will flat out veto this because it will have an impact on my country it will have an impact on the price of energy and he doesn't want that before an election. Maria a busy week ahead for you and for the president for that matter as well Maria today thank you joining us from Brussels we often talk about the story the story sounds ugly then we talk about the price of the story and for some people in this market, the opportunities at the moment, crude higher, yields higher, the curve getting flatter and flatter, pockets of it inverting. Is that the kind of world you want to take risk in? Bob Michael at JP Morgan said this, we seem to have got a year of repricing in just a few months. Simply put, current valuations were too compelling to ignore. There's still reasonable risk, but it feels as though a lot is already in the price. Gershon, you're perfectly positioned to talk about this when it comes to credit. What do you make of that line from Bob Michael over at J.P. Morgan? Yeah, I totally agree. I think a lot is in the price. Um, you know, you look at corporate balance sheets, and as I mentioned in the earlier segment, uh, you know, we had a cleansing, essentially, of the corporate markets. The weaker players, it's a misnomer to think that, that you know, COVID, maybe it sped it up, but it didn't cause a lot of the defaults or restructurings. You had the... You know, the EMP sector, which if they could have held on a little longer, would have, would have done very, very well. You had retailers. You had Hertz doing phenomenally well today. They had to restructure a couple of years ago. So you, you, you really, the weaker players are out of the market. And again, companies have not been aggressive. And you look at EM. I know everyone's so focused on Russia and Ukraine, but the market has just gotten decimated. It's actually it's now the sixth largest drawdown. Um, in the six months following each of those previous five draw, big drawdowns, um, the market has average returning, the hard currency market, over 13%. We think there are a lot of opportunities for corporates as well. So I wouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. There are some interesting opportunities. You do have to balance that. You know, I think you have to respect the fact that curves are flat. When curves are flat, you tend to have, uh, you tend to, should be cautious on risk assets. But offsetting that, I don't think fundamentals have ever been better. And you usually don't see such a sell-off or a spread widening so early in a hiking cycle. Gershon, when it comes to EM, just build on that a little bit more. Do you think China has helped to put a floor under risk appetite? How to put a floor beneath global growth, given what we heard from them last week, and ultimately how to put a floor underneath EM assets too? Yeah, look, I, I, I have not made a career of trying to predict what China's going to do. I think they are quite unpredictable. Uh, I do think that, you know, the, the, the default probabilities are low. Uh, in most of these countries. And it, it's even perverse. Some of the countries, you, you look at a, a Colombia, for example, that benefits from, from higher oil prices as an importer, and their spreads have widened considerably. So I think there's opportunity. Now, fundamentals have absolutely no correlation to what prices do in the short run. So macro news, whether it be on the economy or on the uh, Russia-Ukraine situation, are going to make prices tend to be volatile. But if you have a little bit longer of a... Of a, of a you know, time frame, you know, not days, but perhaps months or quarters, this seems to be a buying opportunity. Eric, do you agree? You've talked about this higher interest rate of the Fed, that they can push it much, much further from here. How does that shape your thoughts about where market leadership comes from? I want to pull out something Gershon just said about the, the, the spread widening and credit we've seen early in the Fed cycle and how unusual that is. You look back at the past couple of tightening cycles and really – you don't get into trouble on risk or credit spreads until very late in that tightening cycle. So from our, our perspective, if you look at the terminal rate and think that's maybe above 3% like we do, there's probably a long way between now and when we start to get really worried about risk assets. And the yield curve, too, and thinking about 
know, that's very close to inverting if you look at twos, tens. But go back to the last tightening cycle, two thousand or sorry, two tightening cycles ago in the the mid two thousands, the twos, tens part of the curve first inverted in late two thousand five. The recession didn't come for another two years, and the the peak in the S and P wasn't for another year and a half. So, uh, John, from our perspective, there, there's still more room to run here uh, in risk assets, and in terms of leadership. We still like those high quality names, you know, in terms of quant factors, that's where we're looking. Uh, we're not ready to go dumpster diving yet. Uh, this is not a situation where you want to get really defensive because I think at a macro level, we do see more room here um, for, for, for risk assets to grind higher. That's the view from Eric Nelson. Wei Lee, what's your view, the conviction call in this market right now? Absolutely. So as we think about some of the macro factors that are playing out and the read across from elevated energy prices uh, and energy vulnerabilities on economy, I would say that the U.S. is better uh, shielded from energy vulnerability in comparison with Europe. So two weeks ago, we upgraded developed market equities and downgraded credit to fund that. And right now, it looks like actually given how well broader market has performed, having a bit of a quality pivot, having a bit of a pivot kind of towards uh, the, the, the U.S. market at this point uh, is uh, it makes uh, makes a lot of sense, especially if you think about what is causing this focus and volatility in bond market at this moment is inflation. And over a longer term horizon, actually, um, earnings, S&P earnings are highly, highly correlated with uh, inflation uh, rates. So actually having that longer term uh, exposure to equity to, to, to S&P uh, at this point makes uh, a lot of sense also from an inflation hedging perspective. Wei Li, thank you. Alongside Gershon Distenfeld and Eric Nelson to the three of you, thank you very much. About seven minutes out from the opening bell. Something really interesting happened yesterday. Yields were much higher. The curve was flatter and banks traded lower. This just dropped from Bank of America. In the 90s, bank earnings were 80% correlated with the yield curve. Those correlations dropped to 17% since 2000. And today, our banks team cites the short end is more important than in the 90s. Now, that's about earnings and profitability. This is what they had to say on PEs. But the sector's PEs still move in lockstep with the curve. They say it's an overly simplistic reaction that ignores history and fundamental sector changes, and that might be the case. But the issue at play here is, yes, the yield curve might not shape earnings in the way it used to, but it still shapes investor appetites to the sector. So what's more important to you, the former or the latter? We'll get into that through the week. Coming up the morning calls and later, Mohammed al Aaron of Bloomberg Opinion joins us at the opening bell. A choice between risking recession and prolonging inflation. That conversation just around the corner. Equity futures up a third of 1%. Here are your morning calls. We begin with Truist upgrading P&G, highlighting the company's trusted brands and recent underperformance. Goldman downgrading Philip Morris, pointing to multiple risks emerging from the uncertainty in Ukraine. And finally, B of A upgrading Sherman Williams, given the company's strengthening pricing power. That stock up by eight tenths of 1%. Coming up, a choice between risking recession and prolonging inflation. It's Mohammed Al Arian at the opening bell. Your opening bell is next. About 25 seconds away from the opening bow this morning. Good morning. Futures are doing OK. We're up a third of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq. Up a little more than a tenth of 1%. I keep saying they're doing OK, given what's happening in this bond market. We've got our teeth into that in just a moment. Let's see opening bow switch on the board. Let's start with Treasuries then. Tenure yields are high by seven basis points, 236.24. Pockets of inversion, as Mohammed would put it. We'll build on that in just a moment. This curve is flatter. Two's tens has been down to 15, 16 basis points, just a little bit steeper right now, up to about 19 basis points. In the FX market, dollar yen, the one to watch, through 120. Euro dollar not doing much, 110.29, up a tenth of 1%. And crude coming down, 7 tenths of 1%, 111.37. 
22 seconds in, let's get you some movers. Here's Abby. John, let's take a look at what is working and what's not, but for the most part, we do have stocks higher, as you were talking about, and one big stock that's helping, big name, I should say, Nike. Shares are popping higher after the company put up a very solid quarter on the top and bottom line beating, plus a sigh of relief that China was less bad than feared. Lots of price targets on the street raised. Tesla up about four tenths of one percent, half a percent. This as they are officially investing in a factory outside of Berlin creates a global manufacturing footprint for the EV company, announced two years ago, and it will uh, increase production of the Model Y. Now, oil just about flat right now and uh, actually down about half a percent, as you were mentioning. Occidental Petroleum down 2.4 percent. This sector, of course, though, yesterday surged. Occidental in particular, so a bit of consolidation. And then banks yesterday, John, so interesting, as you had been pointing out, yields higher, but banks had been lower, probably in sympathy with that flattening yield curve yesterday. But today, Bank of America popping higher with the sector up 2.2 percent. Abby, thank you. About 90 seconds in, up four tenths of one percent on the S&P. Abby going through in the banks and the energy stocks, financials top of the pile, up nine tenths of one percent. Energy at the bottom of the pile. The only negative industry group on the broad industry groups that I follow on my screen. Energy down about four tenths of one percent. Information technology just about hanging in there, up a third of one percent. But this year has been tough given what the Fed's about to do. Let's get more with Bloomberg's Kelly Lyons. Hey, Kelly. Hey, John. Well, this year has been tough primarily because of what we've seen in the bond market, and that was on full display yesterday. Yield shooting higher across the curve in response to the hawkish Chairman Powell uh, over at the NAEP conference. What's interesting, though, is, yes, higher yields, in theory, put more pressure on higher multiple stocks, calls the value of those future earnings into question. And, yes, the NASDAQ 100 did lag the S&P 500 yesterday with a three-tenths of a percent decline, but arguably it's not that big a move considering the scale of the moves we're seeing in fixed income, which raises a question of why the equity market is willing to look through it and why exactly it's behaving in this way. I won't pretend to have an answer to that. What I can look at, though, is history. And when you look at the sector performance during the last hiking cycle, so from December 2015 to December of 2018, technology actually was the biggest outperformer, up more than 50 percent over that time. You had utilities and discretionary hanging in there as well. Financials actually performed roughly in line with the broader market, even though the narrative is higher rates will benefit those banks. What's at the bottom end of the spectrum, more of those cyclical sectors, including energy, which was actually down over that time. Ultimately, the value trade didn't really get a boost from the last hiking cycle. And of course, the subsequent cuts that followed it didn't help either. And so we're still in a long-term trend of underperformance of value relative to growth, even though recently there have been more calls for value to outperform. Though ultimately, where investors come down on either end of that trade, John, likely is going to be influenced by the assumptions made about whether or not the Fed can execute a soft landing or a recession is coming. And let's talk about that now. Kaylee, thank you very much. It's not a secret for me to say that Mohamed al is more diplomatic than I am. This morning, I'm saying he's coming out swinging. You judge for yourself. His words. It's credibility eroded. The central bank appears to have a choice between risking a recession or prolonging inflation. Mohamed goes on to say, the Fed is increasingly being forced to consider those two things, which policy mistake it wishes to be remembered for, meeting its inflation target by causing a recession or allowing high and potentially destabilizing inflation to persist well into 2023. I'm pleased to say Mohammed can speak for himself when he joins us now. Mohammed, do you think it's that binary, one or the other? I do, and I'm really worried about it, John. Why is that? Why do you think there's not an optimal soft landing outcome that Jim Bullard was talking about earlier this morning? So look what's happening in the marketplace. The whole point of forward policy guidance by the Fed is to bring along the markets in an orderly fashion. Instead, we're seeing the markets run away further from the Fed and do so in a disorderly fashion. And that is why the risk of a policy mistake is so high. When you lose credibility, you start chasing the markets, but the markets run away from you even more. And that's the dynamic we saw yesterday when Chair Powell spoke, and it's only a week after the FOMC meeting. Remember, John, the FOMC meeting was last week. We only, we, and we're having this, this dynamic now, and we're seeing it again today. You use that phrase disorderly, that word disorderly. Mohammed. what about what you're seeing across fixed income and equity markets is disorderly? These are massive moves, John, that come on the back of comments from, from a Fed chair. Yesterday, we saw massive moves. Today, we're seeing massive moves. Um, that's what's so disorderly. Do you think we're effectively capturing now what you think this Fed's going to have to do this year? 
No, I think that if the Fed ends up validating what the market is now sort of tempting it to do, the Fed will end up breaking something in, in the economy. Um, but if the Fed doesn't validate what the market has done, the Fed will not reestablish its inflation credibility. That's the lose-lose outcome that you and I have been talking about and I've been worrying about since last summer. Can we deal with should and will and, and get through both those issues? What do you think they should do and what do you think they will actually do? So I, I never would want to be in this position, right? And that's why you heard me advocate for them to take their foot off the accelerator last year and not continue injecting liquidity into this economy until um, earlier this month. But now that you're in this position and you're going to end up making a mistake, which is the high probability outcome, I'd rather make a mistake of letting inflation persist than throw this economy into recession. And what do you think they will do? I don't know, John. They've been flip-flopping all over the place. Um, they are now coming across as incredibly hawkish. A few weeks ago, they were coming across as incredibly dovish. So I don't really know where they are. It seems like a roller coaster right now. Do you think that's the problem at the moment, Mohammed? As you point out, we experienced this with Chairman Powell in December. I remember that, the news conference. He said a certain range of things, and I heard them, and the market didn't trade on them. Then we got the minutes, basically said the same thing, and all of a sudden we traded on them. And a similar dynamics played out in the last week. has not really said much more than he said last week, yet, as you point out, we've got these massive moves. Are you suggesting that the chairman and his words have lost credibility with some market participants? So what I'm suggesting, John, will come as no surprise to you because I've been saying it for a while. They've lost credibility when it comes to inflation fighting. They've lost credibility in terms of their ability to forecast inflation. And they've lost control of their policy narrative. And that's why you're seeing this volatility in the marketplace every time we hear something from Chair Powell. They need to reestablish this um, in the piece you, you mentioned, I go through how you do this, and it starts by being dead honest as to why you made such a big mistake and explaining to people why you're better at forecasting inflation. I don't think that the marketplace believes that the Fed is better. Break-evens moved against the Fed when Chair Powell was saying that he's, he's very serious about addressing inflation. That shows you the lack of credibility that the Fed is facing right now. Mohammed, what's interesting about the forecast is not just the credibility around inflation that some people are questioning, it's also their ability to forecast unemployment. If you go through the summary of economic projections, and I know you have done many times over the last few days, you'll see that 3.5% number for unemployment for this year and again next year. And what I see in the essence of your piece, the cost of reclaiming credibility over inflation fighting is ultimately damage to this economy. Does it make sense to you? I've heard words like fanciful, fantasy land, this idea that they get rates anywhere near high as they want to, Mohammed, without damaging unemployment. Is that even possible? So it is possible under what I call the immaculate solution. And the immaculate solution is that somehow the U.S. economy benefits from a big productivity surge, from a surge in labor force participation, from continued financial market resilience. And somehow this combination immaculately occurs and allows the Fed to deliver on the forecast that you mentioned. But, you know, I don't, I don't believe that immaculate solutions happen every day. So I am concerned. Where do you think neutral is, Mohammed? It's a phrase that gets thrown around a lot. Where do you think it is? And I was fascinated by the discussion because people speak with confidence about neutral. Um, there's two problems. One is that neutral has proven to be very variable. It's not a parameter, it's a variable. And the second is how do you judge neutral taking into account the fact that the economy and the market have been conditioned for years to live with very low interest rates. We don't know the dynamics of adjustment to higher interest rates. So John, bottom line, I don't know what neutral is and I doubt anybody actually can say with confidence when neutral is. I'd make a further suggestion, Mohammed, that neutral for the economy might mean something very different when it comes to the market. I mean, when would it become a problem for the market? We're talking about interest rate hikes 
Jim Bullard of the St. Louis Fed was on the program earlier this morning. I know you followed that interview with Mike McKee. He was talking about 3% on Fed funds by year end. We haven't even started to think about balance sheet reduction either. Mohamed, I'm looking at the market right now, and we seem to be taking this in our stride, in equities at least. Why do you think that is? So that doesn't surprise me. Um, if you're an asset allocator and someone comes up with the proposal that you should reduce equity, you're going to say, well, where do I go? Do you go into cash? Hell no. Inflation is at 7.9%, and I believe we may well touch 10%. You don't want to go there. That's a guaranteed negative real return. Do you go into bonds? Hell no. Bonds are adjusting. And it's a very painful place to be right now. Do you go into commodities? Do you go into Bitcoin? That's incredibly volatile. So you end up not reducing your allocation to equities, but actually looking to increase them. Now, that works as long as we stay in a relative space. And we have been operating in a relative space. That's why stocks have been relatively resilient, incredibly so, in fact. Um, the one thing that you've got to be careful of is that we don't switch regimes into an absolute regime. At that point, stocks become more vulnerable. But it doesn't surprise me that stocks are resilient. Can you build out a little bit more on what would constrain risk appetite, Mohammed? You talked about an absolute regime. Detail what you mean by that. And also, can you throw in the yield curve as well? Should that constrain risk appetite? We've heard from the chairman in the last day or so. He said it wouldn't constrain them necessarily. Do you think it could, could constrain risk appetite in the coming weeks? Would you be comfortably being long equities, given everything you've said, given what's happening with this pocket of inversion emerging through the yield curve, threes, five, sevens, above tens? John, look, if, if I'm investing over the next 12 month horizon, I would reduce equities at this point. I would take some money off the table. I think the market is giving you a wonderful opportunity to come out. Um, and the reason why I do that is I don't think the market has factored in yet what's going to happen to the economy as all these changes start transmitting through the economy. So we are, we are yet to see my baseline for what it's worth is that we're going to see a global stagflation, lower growth, higher inflation. Within that, we're going to see depression in Russia and Ukraine. We're going to see a recession in Europe. We're going to see stagflation in the US. And we're going to see a number of commodity importing developing countries running into debt problems. That's the sort of world we're looking at, given the shocks we're taking. And the equity market hasn't quite priced that in yet because it's still thinking in relative space. Mohamed, you introduced the S word. What does that mean? What does that look like? You've used another phrase in the past, stagflationary wins. What does that all mean? So, first of all, the stagflationary wins have become much, much stronger because of what's happening in Ukraine and Russia. That is a, another stagflationary blow, and it is another great unequalizer. So we do have concerns for the most vulnerable members of our society and the most vulnerable countries. What does it mean? It means you'll see more and more downward revisions in global growth, more and more upward revisions in inflation, and policymakers are going to have less flexibility in responding. Increasingly, they're going to be forced into the choice that no one wants to make, which is which of the two do you target? We'd like to target both. We'd like to target high growth and low inflation. But the more stagflation takes hold, the harder it is to do that. Mahabe, can we finish on something de delicate? I said before the interview started that I'm more diplomatic than you are. That's true. We've been friends for a long time. You'd acknowledge the same thing. Say what you want to say now. If you had a question for Chairman Powell, what would it be? The chairman is still talking about last year as if it was somewhat of a surprise, even though people like you were warning about it quite a lot from the summer onwards, from about June time through the rest of the year. What would you ask him right now? So I would say to, I would ask him, isn't the first step of reestablishing policy credibility involve being open as to why the mistake was made? And what have we changed in order to make sure that that mistake is not repeated? Until we address this basic issue, the marketplace is going to worry about the same mistake being made over and over again, because that's what has happened in the last almost 12 months. What did you make of it when the chairman said in the news conference last week, Mohammed, that this wasn't due to a framework shift, that he didn't want us to blame the framework shift for the reason they're in this position? I was puzzled because I think there's broad agreement that the framework was well designed for a world of deficient aggregate demand. 
and we are living in a world of deficient aggregate supply. So I like that framework, but it's for, the wrong, it's for a world that we no longer live in. So I was puzzled, and I don't think I was the only one. Myself included. Mohammed, fantastic. Really enjoyed the piece this morning. Great read. Brilliant to catch up with you, as always, buddy. Fantastic to have you with us on the programme for a decent amount of time this morning, too. Mohammed Al Erin of Bloomberg Opinion and Queen's College, Cambridge. Your market's doing OK, as Mohammed pointed out. Up another six-tenths of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq, up by seven-tenths of 1%. Coming up, governments and corporations alike ramping up the pressure against Russia. He wasn't anticip anticipating the extent or strength of our unity. And the more his back is against the wall, the greater the severity of the tactics he may employ. Bloomberg's Javier Blas joining us next. Uh, they've just uh, launched the hy their hypersonic missile because it's the only thing that they can get through with that absolute certainty. He wasn't anticip anticipating the extent or strength of our unity. And the more his back is against the wall, the greater the severity of the tactics he may employ. That's another warning from the President of the United States. We've got to do a couple of things now. Speak to two of the best, two of the smartest individuals across Bloomberg Opinion and Bloomberg Intelligence on commodities, Javier Blas, and on China and debt, emerging market debt. Demi Sassa, I want to start with you, Javier. You sent me a message this morning. You wanted to talk about one thing, steel. So let's talk about it, Javier, right now. What's going on? Well, steel prices are rising to a record high, already a record high in Europe, up between 150 and 250 percent from where we were before COVID struck. And what I'm, I'm really concerned is a lot of the focus with Russia and Ukraine is on the oil market, gas market, but steel is in, in crisis mood. And I can think of very few commodities that affect so many industries as, 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 as steel does. This is the automotive industry, railway, construction. Everything is going to get very, very expensive. But uh, what I fear the most is that we may have steel shortages here in Europe or on the summer, particularly for construction. It is a crisis. It's going with very little notice, and I think that we need to highlight it. Javier, the other issue that I think is still going without much notice as well is, is ags. I want to talk about that with you now, that if we can't get the farmers into the field in spring, we've got big problems, haven't we? We are going to have a big problem. Ukraine is a huge uh, exporter of corn. Uh, farmers are not going to be able to be on, 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 the, on, on the fields. And, and the window is going to come close very, very soon. The, the farmers in, in Ukraine need to be um, working on their land in the next 35 to 60 days. If they are unable to do that, we will lose all the corn crop from Ukraine, which is a significant chunk of the, of the worldwide uh, corn crop. Uh, and that will put a lot of pressure come into the, into the fall in the northern hemisphere, come um, October, when we need to harvest that, that crop. It's not going to be there. And um, we're going to have to see much higher prices if that happen. Javier, just awesome to catch up with you, buddy. Great work on this story. Javier Blas on Twitter, at Javier Blas, to follow this story. Pretty much the best out there when it comes to all things commodities. Damien Sasse, the best out there when it comes to credit and emerging market credit. Damien, we've been following the money. Have investors been getting paid? Have they been getting paid? So far, so good, Jonathan. Yes, they have been. Um, it's not easy, though. I mean, a lot of Russian corporates, uh, Evraz, tried to make payment on a coupon. Evraz, as you know, is 24 percent owned by Roman Abramovich. Um, Society General, the correspondent bank, uh, has not approved the transfer to Bank of New York Mellon, so creditors are waiting there. Severstal is another. Um, but yeah, no, Credit Bank of Moscow, which is a systemically important bank, did make a $9.7 million coupon payment today. What's interesting is investors, after Russia, the sovereign, made $117 million of coupon payments last week, Jonathan. We're waiting for another $66 million to clear this week. What's interesting about those bonds is they have the ruble fallback optionality. So they may actually be paying in rubles, not in dollars. And if that happens, offshore creditors may be blocked from accessing those rubles, depending upon where their accounts are located. Just quickly, have any of the events when it comes to payments over the last week, Damien, restored any confidence that you've lost over the last month? You're asking me personally? Let's just talk about the markets. Forget about me personally. I don't own Russian bonds. But the markets, if you just look at five-year credit default swaps as a proxy for sovereign credit risk, 
Yes, you know, CDS has come in quite substantially to 1,900 basis points. I think it had reached over 3,000 basis points at some point last week. So it's coming quite considerably, but it is ticking higher again because look, you know, how long can this can kicking exercise go on, especially with the May 25th US deadline looming? And that's what it feels like for a lot of people a can kicking exercise. Damien, great work as always, buddy. Damien Sasser following the money and seeing investors are getting paid. And so far, they are. Coming up, your trading diary from New York. This is Bloomberg. <music> Financials leading the way on the S&P 500, up about 2%. 26 minutes in, we're up 6 tenths of 1% on the S&P. Helping out the financials. Yields higher by seven or eight basis points across the curve. Tens right now at 237, twos at 218.50 and very close to 220. That's the price section. Here's your trading diary. More Fed speak, Williams, Daily, Mester all on deck. Data, durable goods, and another round of jobless claims coming up on Thursday. Plus, the president heading to Brussels for an emergency meeting with allies. That will take place later this week on Thursday. On Friday, he'll meet with the president of Poland. From New York City, this was the countdown to the open. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV.